I'm Steve Vibronix, and this is the Life in Dub podcast, talking to people who live their lives in dub and reggae. Episode number three. Welcome to the third Life in Dub podcast, a new series of in-depth interviews with people who've lived their lives in dub and reggae. Thanks for all the emails and messages. It's great to hear what you've made of it, so keep those messages coming in and let me know what you think about the podcast. You can subscribe to the show wherever you pick up your podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple, Google, all the usual places. You can email me at vibronix at gmail.com and visit the podcast website, lifeindub.com. This week, I wanted to talk about my studio, the Dub Cupboard Studio. I think it's been in 10 different locations since I started out way back in the 1990s. Well, now it's in location number 11, and what a mission it is to move again. You see, I mix in the old school way, using a mixing desk and racks of old effects units and equipment, all linked together with miles of cables. I basically copy the way King Tubby, Lee Perry, and my absolute hero of dub mixing, The Scientist, invented in Jamaica back in the 1970s and early 80s. So all my gear went up and down several flights of stairs, and I did start to question whether this old way of mixing is for the best. I mean, there are so many producers making amazing music using much more modern techniques, but I just love making music in this traditional way. I genuinely don't think analog techniques necessarily sound any better, but it's just the way I like to work. So with this in mind, it's on with setting everything up for this next chapter. And it's this sense of a new chapter that's the real benefit of moving as far as I'm concerned. When I think back, each studio location is really a different chapter in the life of Vibronics music productions. So I welcome in this new phase and look forward to what it will bring. My guest this week is Maccabee, someone who has actually recorded in two different Vibronics dub cupboard studio locations. I travelled over to Wolverhampton in the West Midlands to sit down with Macca and talk about his life in dub and reggae. Maka is a great talker and our conversation covered many topics, including his early beginnings in music, his TV appearances and even Beyonce's mum. So enough of me, let's get on with the interview. Maccabee, welcome to the Life in Dub podcast. Greetings, blessed love, Rastafari. And here we are in, uh, in Wolverhampton. So Yeah, in Wolverhampton in the West Midlands, UK. I think my first ever trip to Wolverhampton. Yeah, all right, all right. So, yeah, it looks a little bit like Leicester, where I'm from. It's not so far away. Yeah, it would do. It's kind of similar, you know? But, yeah, yeah, so yeah. We're, we're in the Midlands. Um, and what, what I'm doing with the podcast each week is I'm kicking it off by asking everybody to name a song that they listened to and they heard, whether they heard, wherever they heard it. And that is a track which they look back on and it's like that changed everything for me. After I heard that, there was there was no going back. So I was wondering if you've got a track like that that you want you want to share with us yeah it's not really one particular track I think yeah, it can be how you want to yeah I think you find that um, the way the the universe works is like something comes along and pricks your ears and your conscience and then something else comes along and kind of confirms it you know and then something else might come along and you say this is the right thing you know so there's been many kind of songs which I can remember you know which really um, stood out to me. Um, one of them was um, Black Man Time, um, I Rai. I really like I Rai as a, as a DJ. And uh, the lyrics, I thought he was like a, a lyrical genius at the time, you know. And I was well into lyrics myself, you know. And there's also um, the Visions album, Dennis Brown. When I heard that, you know, as a teenager, and I love that album, you know. It was non-stop, I used to play it, you know. And, Satamasa Ghana, Abyssinians, and you know, all these kind of things, and Countryman, um, Twinkle Brothers, you know, all these albums, they stick in my mind, you know, but it's not just music, it's like, I remember like in, when I first saw Roots on the TV. The, the TV show? Yeah, and we realized all about slavery and all these kind of things, because it was hidden from us, so that was a really big part it's, of it's my Alex life. Alex Haley, he wrote yeah, a book. Yeah, Alex yeah. Haley, yeah, that was a really big change in my life to realize what's going on and what I could do to really start help the situation. So I started to incorporate it within my, my lyrics and style, you know. And when, when, when was this sort of period of your life, would you say? Well, I was still at school, you know, so... Talking when, like the, like the 80s, 70s? No, 70s, 70s. Yeah, I know I look younger than... <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah, I talk in the 70s, you know, yeah. 
in the seventies, you know. So that's when I really started to DJ, you know, just as I was coming out of school and thing, you know, and joined a band and everything in the seventies, you know, and the music in the seventies to me was the golden age, you know. I really love the music in the seventies, you know. It, it was really, I think, such a special time for reggae because also it was that reggae had just been invented. It's been around for a long time now, but before the seventies, didn't you know? We had ska and yeah, rock steady, but reggae we really was the seventies thing. Yeah, man, yeah, man. It was, it was really, brand new. Yeah, and it's the vibe and also the the Rastafari influence within it. You know, it kind of gave me a, a identity as a black youth born in England, growing up in England, facing racism facing the national front and all these kind of things you know and so going back to those kind of times like before you became like Maccabee the artist like growing up so you you were born in UK yeah I was born in the UK Jam Jamaican UK. parents yeah 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 I always say I'm African Jamaican born in the UK you know so. and what, what was what, what was it like what was it like growing up in Wolverhampton yeah well the only Very good, different times then. Yeah, it was a different times, and as you know, there's a lot of racism about, you know, and people like Enoch Powell was the, the MP, and, you know, he was the one who did He was the, your MP? Yeah, he did the Rivers of Blood speech and all those kind of things, so you can imagine what it was like in Wolverhampton, you know, and as a youth growing up, the only thing is, there was a lot of us, you know, like from um, Jamaican parentage, you know, and like unity was kind of like a strength towards us, you know, and... Um, if we didn't have each other, then I don't know how it would have turned out, you know, but we had each other and we used to live like Jamaica, you know, we eat Jamaica and we walk with our Jamaica, even as youths, you know, and I think the racism, it kind of, it kind of brought us together even more, you know, because we realized, you know, who we were, what we were up against and who the real enemy was, you know, so it kind of brought us together and we kind of fight against it and we were like the first generation born in the UK. So we were the ones who had to defend it, you know, and our parents, they came, they didn't want no trouble, you know, they it's, came. Yeah, my understanding of it, it's such a different experience, like coming here from the Caribbean, yeah. and being born here to like Caribbean parents. Yeah, because the thing is, we never had no fear, because we grew up, you know, the people who are saying this and that, and you're no good. We knew how they lived, you know, and we knew they weren't better than us, you know what I mean? So we didn't have no fear and, we 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 identified ourselves with Africa and we identified ourselves with Jamaica and certain things we, we wouldn't accept, you know, which our parents accepted, you know. So we were the first generation who really fight against certain things, you know. So we were there and it was it wasn't easy and it was poorer than now, you know, outside toilets and all those kind of things, you know. Yeah, people don't people kind of when you talk about stuff in like the 60s and 70s it's kind of it really you, you're describing a very different world to people who were born like who are young now because things like you say things were different people lived in very different accommodation and the, the whole kind of um, experience people had was very different back then yeah man very different but sometimes the hardship it kind of turns you into a better person you know you get to appreciate of things more you know when you finally do get them you know I think some of the problems with nowadays is Everybody gets everything, you know, so it becomes spoiled, you know, but we had to work for whatever we had. So in a way, you know, we give thanks for that part of our history, you know. Yeah, I think when you look at the, the amount of possessions and expensive things that young people, even people who don't come from any kind of wealthy background, have a lot of, you know, expensive phone, expensive clothes, and they didn't exist back in the day. No, no, like I, had a old, I have an older brother and I had to wait for his clothes. You know, and I'll give thanks for his for the hand me downs, you know. So, you know, some people didn't even have those, you know. So we had to just give thanks for small things, you know. And then I guess so what 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 kind of music were you hearing when when you were young? I mean, what, what kind of stuff was around you? Well, to be honest, the the reggae was around, well, like the, the rock steady and thing. And my um, one of my best friends, he lived like four houses away. And um his father had a sound system. This is in Wolverhampton. Yeah, man, yeah, man. In Wolverhampton, his father had a sound system. It was called Lord Barley Sound. And every Saturday there was blues dances. And we could hear the music. Like I was in my bedroom, I could hear the bass coming down the street, you know. So you're talking about like a blues, like in someone's house? Yeah, in the house, yeah, because the reality of the situation is there was 
um, so much racism at that time. Um, you couldn't go to certain clubs as black people, you know. So they had to kind of do their own entertainment. So they congregated in some houses on Saturday nights, and you know, sometimes the children are upstairs, you know, sleeping. Got the beers make you sleep, you know. So, so the children are upstairs sleeping and thing, and the music are going, you know, and everybody just full joy in themselves, you know. And I could hear every Saturday night uh, the music and everything. And I used to say to my my friend, I said, uh, one day we're gonna have to have a sound system ourselves, you know. And it just so happened that the father passed down that sound to the son. So we had a sound system while we were still at school, you know. But I wasn't just listening to reggae music, you know. I used to, I used to like listening to um, even like Stevie Wonder and, you know, um, albums like Songs in the Key of Life. You know, we buy those, those albums, you know. Yeah, the classic albums. soul stuff. Yeah, man, yeah, man. And with a message, you know. Me never really just like the, you know, just the I love you, you love me thing, although it's good. But I like to hear the message as well. And Stevie Wonder, a lot of his songs, they had a message, you know. So that's what we used to listen to as well, you know. So these, these, these blues dances, I mean, do you have any recollection of, of going to any of these like sessions yourself? And Yeah, when we get a little bit older, yeah, 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 yeah. And it, it was nice, the vibe. I said people enjoying themselves, you know. There was no trouble, there was no fighting, you know. You know, like... Some people say you're too young to be in here, you have to go home and all those kind of things, you know. But we just give thanks, you know. It's a different time to know, you know. You didn't have to watch your brethren or watch your friends or anything or postcode wars and all those kind of things, you know. It was a, a cooler vibe, you know. So I give thanks that I was born in that time, to be honest, you know. So we know the difference, you know, and we can tell the youths how it used to be and how it can still be. Yeah, because I mean, again, my, my impression of it is that, especially in those times, like before, long before I discovered reggae music, that it was really like, um, like a really powerful thing for the community to come together around the music and a kind of place to be where you weren't going to witness racism and kind of all the like political harshness that was going on in UK at the time. Yeah, man, exactly. Still, yeah, yeah, yeah. And even when we first started to DJ on the microphone, we were like news readers, you know. It's like when we start talking about certain things which are happening in society and even on the news and all those kind of things, the people just loved it, you know, and the vibes was just like electric, you know. It's it's a pity that a lot of technology wasn't there then so people could really hear and see what it was like at that time, you know. It'd be a, they would be amazed. Yeah, because like now, everything, especially recently, where everything's like live streamed, you know, I went to a concert the other day and everybody had their phone recording the song. But back in the day, there's so when I ever see a picture from back in the day of, you know, because I'm interested in the history of it. So when I see a picture of a, a sound or a dance or something, it's like, wow, great! I've not seen that photo before because they're yeah. so rare. Yeah, and then mostly action photos. You know, see people dancing and all those kind of things. You know, and like with the phone thing now, it's like people they're not really getting the full 100 of the atmosphere and everything. Cause they can't move. For one, they gotta keep still. You know, even though, and when you hear music, you can't keep still. You know what I mean? When you really hear music, so you gotta keep still. So they're losing a lot of the vibes, you know, and they take them, they take it home and watch it at home and maybe dance at home. But you've lost the vibe, you know. So yeah, and then you're looking at it from a perspective of it being a recorded thing, and it's because it's not a record. When live music's a different thing. Exactly. It's exactly. that. It's that you'd in that moment. That's why you're there. Yeah, I can see coming to the stage where um, they'll ban phones from some live concerts, you know. I know some comedians do it. They ban phones in their in, in their concerts, you know. And I think in live concerts it would be good as well. Yeah, know? but it's because it's it's that special thing. You don't really know how it's going to be. Yeah. You might have heard some rumors. Oh, the artist is going to sing this or do this, or the band's going to be that. Yeah. But you have to go to see it. Whereas now you can just watch the whole thing exactly <laughs> on it, YouTube or on Facebook or whatever. And it will make more people go to shows as well. Agree. So, so, so talking about music and stuff, it's like, so you, you, you started a sound system yourself, so you, you were still at school. Yeah, it was at school, yeah. And at first, I wasn't like the, the microphone, man, you know. I was just glad to be with a sound, just you, the vibe of being with a sound. And the sound had, a, had someone on the mic already? Yeah, they had somebody on the mic already, yeah. And, um, but I used to just love carrying the boxes, just getting into the dances, you know, and going to the record shop, buying records, you know. It was just a nice thing for me, you know. But at home, 
I was a microphone person, you know, but I was kind of shy. So I didn't really do it live, you know, in the dance and thing. But as I say, I used to listen to the I Rise and the big youths and the U Rise, you know, and, and kind of copy them, you know. You would say piracy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I guess in those times, there's so, the reggae scene was quite, was big. There were a lot of sound systems, a lot of people chatting on the mic. I yeah. guess there's a lot of people who are really good. So it's kind of oh, not as good as these guys or, Kind of, there's 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 a there's a very big scene for it. So it's kind of yeah. takes a, a while to get that confidence, I guess. Yeah, but it just so happened that we were playing in a youth club in Wolverhampton, and um, we string up the sound, and the sound was there, and everybody says, "All right, the sound string up. We're gonna get something to eat and come back." And then say, "Maka, you just watch the sound." So I say, "Yeah, man, man, watch the sound." So they went, and the sound just there, you know, and it's on. So I just put on a tune and testing the microphone and everything. and But they hadn't gone yet. And they didn't realize that I could chat like that, you know. So they said, Maka, you have to start DJ on the sound now. So that's when I did, you know. And at first, as I say, I was just copying the great DJs of the time. But then I said, well, hey, let me make up my own lyrics and see what happens. So I made up a lyrics, you know. And the response and the reaction, the people went crazy, you know, because they could identify with what I was talking about, you know. And do you remember what you what you were talking about at that time? Yeah, it wasn't nothing like super conscious or nothing like that. It was just like one of my brethren. He went to he went to London, and he bought a um, a weatherman hat, you know, in Brixton. There's a shop called Weatherman Shop next to Black Adred Music Store, and he bought a weatherman hat. And he brought it back to Wolverhampton. And he was supposed to give it to me at a dance. So he was inside the dance and he said, yeah, man, it's not a car. So he gave me the keys for the car. And he was a Blue Avenger. and A Vauxhall? Yeah, a Blue Avenger. So I went in there and um, I went into the car and it wasn't in there. And I went back in there and I said, it's not in the car. And and come back out and I'd actually looked in the wrong car his key fitted in a different car you know so it was just like a simple thing like that you know I just made a lyrics about it you know and everybody knew about it and they thought wow that's, that's good you're, you're very creative you know so I said yeah man let me just start creating my own lyrics from then you know so that's what I did start to create my own lyrics and develop my own style you know I'm always interested in this like lyrical creativity and I've asked a few people about this because because I, I can't write lyrics, but I, I love lyrics. I'm amazed by them. So did you, when, when did you start writing stuff and coming up with ideas and things? Because not everyone, I've, I've never really done it. So, you know, was it something you, you did from an early age or? You write a couple of things from early, you know, because I always liked words, you know. I was very lyrical, you know. Even even at school, I did well in, in English, you know. I got an O level in English, amazing, you know. And so I always liked words and had a lot of words, you know, it's like the dictionaries and all those kind of things. So I found when I did start writing lyrics, it kind of came easily. Because the more words you have, the easier it is, you know. So I started to write lyrics from when I was young. But as I said, I never performed them until such time where I started to say, yeah, I'm going to just write and perform my own lyrics. So I find they just come, you know. So when you were young, you you just make stuff up, and then yeah, would you would you share that with your friends, and they'd be kind of amazed by that you can make stuff up, or because yeah, but I'm not everyone has their skills. Up. Like some people are great painters, some people are great sports people, and then there's always someone who's who's got some lyrics, you know. Yeah, but the thing is, that I'm not making it up. It's just reality. I'm just organizing it into my lyrics, you know. So that's the great thing. Even now, most of my lyrics they're just reality, you know. I can just walk out there, see something on the street, and you just make up my lyrics about it, you know. It, when it comes, it comes, you know. It's like sometimes a producer can give you a rhythm and say, Maka, can you do something on this rhythm? And nothing don't come, you know. You think, ah, oh, nothing don't come. And then you go away and leave it and bam, it just comes, you know. And you got to be there at the moment, you know. That's why I used to have like a dictaphone, you know. So just in case, because sometimes when it's gone, it's gone. Yeah, if you capture that moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now you have the phone, you know, so... You just, you just do the smart record and you just do it, you know, at the same time so you don't forget it, you know. But I find it comes when it comes, you know, and and to be honest, um, we find said the herb, it's like a, it's like a key, you know, it, like it busts the padlock on your brain for certain lyrical things, you know, so 
it's just a reality, you know. So I, and it allows you to kind of free up the mind and get it flowing. Most, most definitely, most definitely. Not all the time, you know. I mean, you don't need it all the time, but I find that in the past it it has done that, you know. Guys are. It's a holy herb. It's a meditative thing, you know. It's a spiritual thing, you know. So, it's it's it's, it's food for the brain, you know. Yeah, I mean, for me too. When I, when I was making music originally, then I really found that I could like get deep into the music, for sure. Exactly. For it's sure. not a, it's not a cliche, you know. It's a real thing. Yeah, you know? absolutely. <laughs> I know. I agree. I, yeah. I agree. And um, and you and obviously you're still writing lyrics all the time. Now you say your your, your phone's like full of lyrics and full of ideas that you yeah. just kind of jot down in the middle of the night and things. Yeah, just the ideas, you know. After after you get the idea, you can just develop it, you know, whether I write it down or whatever. Uh, you find nowadays um, a lot of artists. I don't like to do it. I prefer to to write down the, the whole song. But a lot of artists now they are going to the studio and do line by line. They'll do one line. No. Yeah, man, yeah, man, yeah, man. A lot of artists now, they'll do one line. And it's all right, what's the next line? Then punch me in. So they record they that another, one line. Yeah, wow. then they think of another line. And then do the next line and think of another line. You'll be very surprised how many artists do that now. That's, I mean, it's, it's whatever works, I guess. But there's something about starting with the end in mind. Like it's like writing a song. Yeah, and continuity. Because that's, yeah. that's what I'm, because it's quite a discipline to write a song because you've got to fit it into this few minutes. Yeah. Verse, chorus, rhyming, it's got to work. Yeah, man, it's an art. It's an art form within itself, you know, and not everybody can do it, but to be honest, if you listen to a lot of the music nowadays, you, you can almost tell, you know, who's doing it like that, you know. Guy, it, it, it doesn't really comprehend together, you know. It's like, it's not like on one subject, you know. Yeah, like if you're writing a story, it's a whole story. It's, I'm going to tell you the story. It starts like this, bam, bam, bang, all yeah. the way through. And it kind of goes somewhere and completes at the end. Yeah. Whereas if you're doing it line by line, maybe it's going to be all over the show. All over the place. And even I come from the school, like even like when you see DJ with Saxon and Wasifa and everybody, you know, sometimes we have lyrics where the rhyme is our one rhyme, <laughs> you know. You have to know your words for that. Yeah, like you have you to know really your words. Know yeah, that. yeah, yeah. But it's like a thing. If you're a skilled DJ, you know, you can do it like that. So we come from that kind of school, you know. So when you say like about those sound systems, Saxon and Wasifer, and so moving on from being in school and having a sound and playing at the youth centre and picking up the mic, then what I th when I think of Birmingham and sound system, I think of a big scene for sound system and like a militant scene for sound system. And yeah, yeah. I wonder what your recollections of, of that were like, like from I guess like late seventies and eighties. And yeah, well, as you know, I'm from Wolverhampton, so the sound which um, me and my bridge in them did at school was called Exodus, where Rasta used at that time. So it was a conscious sound. It was like a, it was a root sound. You know, even though I was DJing, it's like a root sound, like more like Jashaka thing we are playing, you know, and it was nice, you know. And we used to listen to um, Jashaka. We used to listen to Coxon, because Coxon had a residency in Wolverhampton. What, like a monthly thing or something? It, or? it felt like weekly. <laughs> yeah, Coxon used to play at 67 Club, you know, and it was great. It's like an eye up now, you know, because Coxon was a big sound at that time. And I remember Festus, the great selector, and Black and Lady and all of them were there, you know, and they used to have clashes as well. Cause I remember one dance they played against, um, they played against Mafia Tone. Mafia Tone was a big sound from Birmingham, you know, big, big sound, Caretaker and Stafford. And they played um, in the 67 Club. And um, Coxon had this dub called um, From Creation. Because them tiny, the dub. The Don Carlos. No, no, it wasn't Don Carlos cut. That come after. And, um, I forget who sing the, the original. I think it's um, something like Clive Hilton. It's an upsetter, the original, original. So... Coxon was the only song who played. And they must, they, when they played the, the song, they say, one song in the world, Sir Coxon. But them never knew us, say, Mafia had gone to Jamaica and got the dub. I don't know how he got it, but he got the dub. And he played it back against Coxon. And the place went crazy. You know, the place went mad. And um, remember, Coxon was supposed to play Mafia um, in Nottingham, maybe a week after that. And I heard he brought like 70 boxes. <laughs> he had to come equipped yeah he come for kill him you know but <laughs> you know but those days it, it was nice and it was like an eye open and you know dances was was really nice you know them times you have songs like Quaker City 
less Birmingham sound yeah, as well. Yeah, Quaker obviously. City, and they were one of the crisis sounds for clarity. They was one of the crisis sounds you ever hear, you know. They had some big boxes and they sound clean, you know, and Quaker, a really good sound, you know. They had sounds like from Birmingham called Jungle Man, and Jungle Man was a root sound, Rasta Man sound, all of them dressed in khaki suits, you know. All of them woolly pa jedlocks, one had seven locks, one had one locks. You know what I mean? It was nice, you know. And the boxes had tires all over them, you know. And it was good. They played against their shaka and, you know, they play, they play against Ja Toby, they play against Woody Pa sound, you know. And it was a real good root sound, Massigan sound. It was a lot of Rasta sounds at that time, you know. And would you go to London and play the London sounds as well? Well, at that time, I was with Exodus. We more kind of played like uh, we played against, uh, I think Baron in Manchester. In Manchester, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we played in Gloucester against some song. We played in Northampton, but we didn't go and play the London song. That was later on with Wasifa. We used to play the London songs, you know. But at that time, all those big songs, Quaker and Shaka and Cox and Mombasa, you know, what I mean, we used to listen to all of them and really get a good vibe from them, you know. But then further down, um, Wasifa, um, they heard me on Exodus Sound and they asked me to come and join their sound. So I went to Birmingham and checked them out and find and some. how? Because obviously, when you start, you, you know people don't confidence builds as you as you go down the road of music. So when you've got a bigger sound asking you to come and chat on their sound, then that must have been quite an experience, I guess. Yeah, man, yeah, man, it's good still. But I still have to check them out, you know, because, you know, sometimes you, you go bigger, but the vibes, you know, the vibes get less. So I went and checked them out, and they were based around their mother's house and everything, and I find they had really good vibes, you know, which really means a lot to me, you know. We can't take the bad vibration, you know, so they had a good vibes and everything, and the Roots as well, played a lot of Roots music and thing, and Rasta and everything, you know. So... Yeah, we started chat with Wasifa Sound. And, and that was a, a bigger sound at the time. Yeah, that was a bigger sound. And they started to play all over Birmingham and they started to play even certain in London and even in Leicester. Yeah, yeah, well, Leicester was the place. I mean, it was before my time, but I hear so many stories about it. Yeah, man. The community yeah, man. centre and the workshop and... Yeah. Yeah, and Leicester was a, one, of, one of the dances. One of the dances I really remember was in Leicester and we played against Saxon. And this I, is Wasifa Saxon. Wasifa and Saxon. And Saxon at that time was the number one sound, you know, because they had all the DJs, like Tipa and Papa Levi and even Maxi Priest and all of them was Monk Saxon and thing. And I think there was me and Sister Dan, you know, we chatting on Wasifa sound. And, and uh, we did really good in the dance, you know, mash up Saxon in the dance and other people, they must say, yeah, man, I was if I take that dance there, you know, and there's some people even have a cassette yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've seen, I've seen the tapes. I've You've got, I've got a few myself, and they've been circulating. Like, okay, okay. Yeah, of course. People still have cassette at the dance, and that's one of the reasons why um, I got to record for Fashion Records. Someone heard one of these tapes from the dance. Yeah, they, um, John at Fashion Records, he heard it. He heard the tape, and he says, "Yeah, Maccabi, we want you to come and um, record something for us." So that's when I recorded by Barita. And that was your first. Was that your first time in the studio? No, not really, because... Um, there must have been studios around here, I guess, and people yeah. doing something musically. And Obviously, you know, Birmingham's got a huge history of music and musicians. And Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the thing is, after I... Um, when I was with Exodus Sound, um, after leaving school, I joined a band, you know? Uh, as as the, the front man? Yeah, as a DJ. They already had a singer, so I was a DJ, you know? So I was with the band and you know, with the musicians, so rehearsing and everything. And they also had a studio, so we recorded some songs there, you know, in Wolverhampton with the band as well. And I also recorded a song um, in 82 with um, a producer called Papa P. And that's here in Birmingham? No, that's in London. Uh -huh. That's for Sapphire Records. And I did a song called Maggie's Letter where it was like, I was writing a letter to Margaret Thatcher, telling her that I can run the country better than she, you know. So from them time there, you know, being to the consciousness and the social commentary and thing, you know. So that was my first 
like yeah, how the biggest was it release. Being because when you recorded and you listen back and everything, then because there's a difference, I think, between being involved in music and enjoying it and everything to then you on a record and then you're on a level with all these big artists and it's kind of you get compared to those artists and you, you enter a different kind of chapter i think yeah 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 but it's so it did sound good you know and it wasn't like i wasn't talking no foolishness or something that i'd be ashamed of later on in life you know it's some it's conscious lyrics all the way you know so even if you listen to the very first lyrics you know no foolishness, you know, just trying to uplift, you know. Sometimes you talk a humorous one or whatever, but it's always trying to uplift. So when I listen back to the the, the songs, you know, I just give thanks that I'm able to do it, that, you know, I got the so-called talent to be able to do it and be given the opportunity to do it, you know. And what, what, what was the reaction to some of those, like, early recordings? Cause... Yeah, man, people like, love them, man. Yeah, yeah, they really like them a lot. I remember um, even we played... Um, in the band played in London, a um, place called Cat's Whispers. Uh, Radigan was playing here. It's the first time Radigan ever hear me and he'd come round the back and said, Wow, oh, you're good, you know. Love to hear you on records. And Larry, that was from, that's in the, I think that's late 70s, I think, or early 80s still. Yeah, man, but me, me give thanks. And I think one of the, the times that helped me as well when I first went to Jamaica. And when, it, when would that have been? That's in 82, you know, in 82, you know. So, so Air Jamaica or British Airways? No, it was Air Jamaica still. Yeah, 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 yeah Air Jamaica. And it's the first time I met some of my um, sisters, you know, because my parents come to England and left a lot of the children in but Jamaica. There's family back in Jamaica. Yeah, they came here to make a better life and then with the intention of going back to Jamaica or sending for them, but sometimes it doesn't work out. Or you well, want especially when it, it happens to lots of different communities. Once you have kids, kids yeah. are in school, and then you stay much, much longer than you ever think. Yeah, yeah. And they didn't actually get to go back. You see what I say? So, so in '82, I got to see them, like my f- four sisters and two brothers out there, you know. And it's a good vibe, you know, it's a good band and everything. The way we went to Jamaica first, it was like with the youth club. So 30 of us went. This is the, in, in 82. Yeah, the 30 yeah. of us went you know, and stayed in Montego Bay and for a week and then you could go amongst your family. There's 30 of you on the plane. 30 of us, yeah. And when we were in Montego Bay, we all went to a, a session and there's a session there and them say, we have somebody who can chat on the microphone, you know, and then, and the yard man, them say, yeah, who? Say, Maka. So, say, all right, make him, make him talk. So I talk on the microphone and please mash up, you know what I mean? And, <laughs> And it made me feel good. I said, wow, well, I'm in Jamaica and the people them like it. You know what I mean? I think I'd try and make a career out of it, you know, so. But those things stick in your mind as moments where it's like, well, this, this, is, this is going all right. People like what I do. Is yeah. that they're really like memorable. It's that those moments you look back and think, oh, I did that. And then I got some confidence or yeah, just yeah, something yeah. helped propel me forward. Yeah, man, it gave me extra vibes, you know, so I give thanks for those little moments, you know. It must be interesting going to Jamaica, being brought up, in Wolverhampton, but having such a big Jamaica influence from family and friends, and then to finally go back. No, it was it was great to be honest. Cause I like I felt at home, you know. Cause even though we're living in England, we're living like Jamaicans, you know. So when I'm gonna eat, I'm eating what I'm eating already, you know. I love Aki and Kalalo and all those kind of things anyway, you know. So I'm just eating like how I'm eating, and the sunshine, I love the sunshine and the coconuts and all those kind of things, and then. There's reggae music blazing all over the place, you know, you're walking down. At that time, I think um, Twinkle Brothers Rasta Pantap was one of the big tunes. Everywhere you walk, you hear Rasta Pantap and you see Wally Paras and, you know, it was a great feeling. Yeah. And you come back to grey, grey West Midlands. Yeah, but your family is there as well, of course, you yeah. know, so sometimes it's not the place, you know, it's, it's the people, you know. And um, so and with the sound system, then started to bring you to the attention of, of, of producers and people they could hear that it's like this guy's got some lyrics he's got a voice and then you started releasing some records and things and then because there was a big scene for reggae in the 80s I mean it was not like now it was kind of it was new and exciting and I, I don't know what it was like for you at that time yeah man it was exciting still um, and I think one of the things which helped me as well I think in uh, 83 
there was a a talent competition with a DJ competition in in Wolverhampton and a place called Rising Star. And Pato was in the competition, Pato Banton. Rankinan was in the competition. I was in the competition. Some others was in the competition. And I won the competition. And one of the prizes was to go onto the radio. So I went onto the radio, um, WM, a DJ called Des Mitchell, and talk some lyrics live on the radio and got a very good response, you know. So some people was uh, tuning in and they said they got a program called Ebony on BBC Two, what they do in Bristol. And they say, oh, it would be nice if, if once a week you come down to the studio and do a lyrics about something pertaining to the black community. This is BBC TV. I, mean, yeah. I remember Ebony being on TV. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is BBC TV, yeah. So that's what I did. I did a series in uh, Ebony and Godongli and talk some lyrics and everything. And, you know, it's getting kind of popular, you know. Well, when you're on TV, I mean, it's the, even now, if you make it onto TV, even, even people who don't talk about TV, people do watch it and you'd be, people will know, oh, I saw you on the news, I saw you on whatever. Yeah, 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 but back yeah. then, when there weren't any other entertainment channels, I guess if you're on TV, then so if you're on TV and you come back, so you, you, your face is there, you're, they're recording you. Yeah, man, yeah, And man. then you come back here and it's like... Yeah, man, big things are going. People are going to notice you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like the, the bus driver like. and people who'd never pay any attention to you, I yeah. guess, as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it depends who was watching Ebony at the time as well, you know, that sort of thing. But, yeah, it was good still, you know, and I'd say you get a lot of props and a lot of respect for it, you know. And it was through one of these programs at Ebony that I got to meet my professor. He saw one of these and he sent a message with him. With um, Peter Culture, telling him can contact him and you know Kai wouldn't mind doing some work, you know. So I went down there and he played me some rhythms and I liked the rhythms and I talked some lyrics. He liked the lyrics, so then we just got together and did the, the album Sign of the Times, which was in uh, '85, released in '86, and it did well. It went number one in the reggae charts and thing, and and a whole a whole another new chapter, you know. Yeah, because I mean Ariwa was. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a big label now, but back then they were having like big lovers rock hits. I've just been doing a lot of work with Sandra Cross, and like some of yeah. those tunes were like really big tunes. And so it's a it must have been you know a cool thing to be involved in at the time. Yeah, man, it was good still, you know, because I had good vibes, you know, and I could kind of be myself, you know, because Professor is conscious a certain way, you know, like you have some labels and producers. Uh, they don't want you to talk certain things. They say, you know, that might be too much. It might be, you know, can you tone it down a little bit? But my professor didn't mind, you know, from it was conscious and it made sense. He just allowed me to be who I am, you know. So that's why some of the some of the lyrics, you know, they're, they're powerful, you know. Yeah, I mean, I remember those releases, amazing, and like, and they and they seemed to do well. They were like they were popular. Everybody had, especially in those days. A lot of LPs as well, and people would have a Maccabee LP yeah, you know, yeah, in their collection. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's a big thing. Yeah, man, the LPs is like, it's a, it's a good thing still. Cause you can express yourself, you know, more than just a, a one single and you get a, you know, a, a little break with a single. With an album now, they, they take time and they listen to you, you know, and play the album and play it all the way through, you know. So being a person who have lyrics as well and the rhythms are nice as well, you know. It's a natural progression, you know, to start doing albums, you know. And I guess it's a different thing to live as well because, like, being in a studio and recording is a bit of a different experience to being in the dance and, you know, lively and people up and whatever. It's kind of, I don't yeah. know how you kind of found those two worlds to be kind of... Well, to be honest, I was kind of used to it already because I was with the band from early you know, so to me it was like a natural thing, you know, I was like in a studio from from a kind of leaving school kind of thing, you know, so when I'm going to a bigger studio, you know, it's just a bigger studio, but it's exactly the same kind of vibes, you know, so it was fine to say, yeah, you're comfortable in it, you know, it's like, and I was comf uncomfortable live because I've been doing it for so long, you know, from early, you know, like you have a lot of artists now, like they're good in the studio, but live, you know, because they never really did the live, you know, um, they never really did the sound system part, you know. 
which it's I like, see as it's a, a, it's a schooling, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's your apprenticeship, you know, the sound system is where you, you test out lyrics, you know, you test out styles, you know, and see what works and what don't work. And you have to all a crowd for like hours. It's not like nowhere. Yeah, you, you be on stage for two hours. Then you have to chat for like seven hours. You know what I mean? Not constantly. Like you play the vocal, then you have to chat. You play another vocal, then you have to chat, you know? And you have to keep the people there, you know? Captivated for all those hours. And, and you've got to deal with all the technical stuff because it doesn't always sound great, but you've still got to go through and whatever. And I've seen that put people off who've got no experience of it. But when you've been through sound system and dealt with the worst mic and yeah, yeah, everything, yeah. you can do anything, I think. Yeah, my, yeah, my. The first song I was with it, it, it broke down quite a few times, you know, in other dance, you know, some big dance as well. But as you say, you just got through and you just learn from it, you know. Yeah, that's it. I think it's, 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 yeah, it must have been really a great schooling. But it's interesting you talk about the live band and the way that you did it. You were involved in the live band a long time ago as well, because that's what I think a lot of people think of you now as being um, on tour with a live band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we give thanks that you can make that pr progression, you know. Um, uh, it's good with the sound, but it's also nice with the band, just people to see the musicians actually how they make the tunes, you know. It's like, it's a great thing. Some people, they don't, they don't really understand how music is made, you know. But when you can see it, you say, oh, that's the bass line. Oh, he, that's, he's playing that. Oh, so the keyboard man, he's playing that, you know. Oh, that's the drummer doing that, you know. So it's a great thing. It's like a schooling for them as well, you know, and visually it's nice as well, you know. So we have to we have to big up the musicians because without the musicians, there's no music, if you know what I mean. So well, your band always totally on point. I mean, you, you you put together a great band, definitely. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. We we rehearse enough as well, you know. So okay, you still like. Yeah, man. We still rehearse every week and thing, you know. Cause you have to, as I say, you have to keep things on point, you know. So. That's, that's one of the things, eh? even with the great Jamaican bands, they don't just turn up, you know? Practice makes perfect, you know? It's like football. Yeah, it's a discipline, you know? isn't yeah, it? Yeah, the best footballers, they, they stay behind when everybody's gone home, you know, and they practice their skills and everything, you know? So as you say, it's a discipline, you know? Yeah, that's it, because you might have the natural talent or ability, but to, to hone it into something which is really going to kind of like move you forward, yeah, you have to... You have to have the discipline. Yeah, man, most definitely. And the ones who kind of make it, you'll be very surprised how hard they work, you know. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I think there's people who maybe seem kind of more like characters and whatever, but but, but everybody who's working, they are working. It's hard work and, you you know, you have to, um, all the traveling and everything around it, it's kind yeah, of, yeah, it's, it's not for everybody, that kind of lifestyle. No, no, definitely not. Uh, but some people, it, it's a persona. They just look like they're not doing anything, but they're really working hard, you know, I when agree. you don't see them, you know. Really, in a, some people in a studio 24-7, you know, and you see them out there, look like, oh, they're happy-go-lucky, you know, but they're really hard workers, you know. So I have to just give thanks, you know. And with the, like the, the band and, and traveling and stuff, it's kind of, again, it's something I've asked quite a few people about because it's something that um, has really surprised me is just how far music can take you. You know, you started off in Wolverhampton playing, you know, in school and stuff. And then now you're like a global like reggae artist. And is, is that a surprise at all, how, how far you've traveled? Sometimes it can be at first, you know, but no, it's not, you know. Um, come from the... 80s um, with Ariwa, we started to travel Europe a lot, you know. And how, how was it then? Because that must have been an experience to go to these places like earlier, because people weren't traveling so much. It was more of a big deal to travel then, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like an eye opener, you know, because you hear about certain places, but it's not until you actually go there, you kind of see what the vibes really is, you know. And there's the negative there, but there's positive as well, you know. So especially for the reggae music, you didn't realize how much people love reggae music, you know. When I went to, um, it was Yugoslavia then, before them break up. And um, there's a big festival in our forest and there must have been like maybe 15,000 people there. They couldn't believe it, you know, and we mash up the place and people them love it. And I think, wow. And when we started to go to Germany, we got so popular, you know. We were selling out all over the place, you know. And even now, um, a lot of Germans who first got into reggae is when Maccabee and my professor first started to go to Germany, you know. At first, they were just listening to, like, like Bob Marley's and the Burning Spears and the Roots. 
But me come with a, a style we call Roots Raga. So we mix the DJ style with the Roots and they, they, they kind of love it, you know. So that's the way you get more DJ styles to come into Germany. And, and that's like, the, the, obviously the UK experience, it's linked like entirely to the Caribbean thing, but it's also, it's, it's its own thing as well. And like Saxon and these sounds yeah, have brought yeah. their own thing and it's kind of, and then that seemed to kind of, spread across Europe and as you say being influential so like like in Germany there's a big scene for Massive. dance hall and yeah. chatting on the mic and it's like I guess yeah like you say influenced by yeah, man. you going over there and yeah man we all say like uh, we make the Germans jump to reggae and if you ask them they'll, they'll tell you you know we're like our um, summer jam and all we were on the first ones you know we see when it starts at some liquor festival that's and, a huge thing yeah I know it, it massive you know so France is the same you know Let's go France and all those places and we even spread further afield you know went to America and I was the first DJ to tour Australia first reggae artist not even DJ reggae artist to tour like in Australia, and that was an eye opener as well, you know, travel so far. And I remember, like, we played at, by Sydney, um, the Opera House. Yeah, we played right there. And at that time, I had a tune called um, Get Rid of Maggie, you know. And somebody says to the um, promoter, shall he, shall he do that song, Get Rid of Maggie? Because politicians was there. It's like, it's like a big dance, you know. And we say, well, they don't, they're not so sure. But I said, I'm going to do it anyway. And it mash up the place because them not like Maggie Thatcher neither. Yeah, it, yeah, just people went crazy, you know. So it was it was a good experience still. And actually things like um, meeting the Aborigines, you know, the, the indigenous people of Australia, you know, it was a good thing. Uh, we were in some of the shows. We were saying, oh, come when I see an Aborigine in I show. And the people were saying, them can't afford it. They haven't got any money. So we went to, um, I think it's Redfern, um, the ghetto. It's a really a rough ghetto. You see, burn up police car and all them someday, you know, rough ghetto. And we said to them, get speakers, microphone, and something to play the music, and we'll come to you. So that's what we did. We went on the street in the ghetto. Nice. And we do a show for them, you know. And how was that? No, man, them love it, man. Yeah, man, yeah, man. Car, they bring them all of them Black Power t shirts and all them kind of thing, you know. It's, no, nah, man, it's a joyful thing, you know. So, yeah. So, I mean, I said traveling, you kind of warp in your minds, you know, as we say. And yeah, you see some different things and, and, and you go through it's because it's, I love traveling. I really enjoy it. But especially in the days now of social media things, it can look much more glamorous than it is. And a lot of it's hard work. It's yeah, like, man, and you're yeah, away man. from your family as well. It's yeah, kind of hard yeah. on many levels. But, but it's really, as you say, really an eye opening thing, I find. Yeah, man, when you tell people you've been here, there, and everywhere, it's, oh, they think you're going on holiday. Whereas you know, sometimes it's from airport to, to, to hotel, to, to venue, to hotel, back to the airport again, you know. You don't even get to see nowhere yet, more than so, you know. But sometimes you do get to see some places, you know, and meeting certain good people as well, you know. So, as I say, we give thanks that give them the opportunity to do it, you know, and travel and see the world, you know. And you're still traveling now. We were talking when I arrived about you're off to India soon and it's kind of yeah. all these new countries couldn't imagine playing a few years ago. No, no. Even like Malaysia. The other day I was in Malaysia, you know. And in Kuala Lumpur? No, no. In the rainforest in Borneo. Wow. Yeah, in the rainforest festival and it was good, you know. Like the night we were on, like the players ram up, you know. It's like I think we're the first reggae artist who's played at that festival and it went on really, really good. You know, really, really well, you know. Um, cause, you know, that's a place, Malaysia's a place where even the, the, the ganja laws are very strict. Yeah. You know, it's, a, it's death penalty for selling and all those kind of things. But when we draw the medical marijuana car, the place mash up. The right. people are shout out and even politician was there and is smiling and, and laughing, you know. Cause I did my research, you know. I don't just go to a place and talk. I do my research and I realize that... Um, they were thinking of um, having medical marijuana in, Mal in Malaysia and Thailand as the first two places in Asia, you know. So you have to do your research when you don't just go to a place, you know. I mean, do your research about the place. And, you know, you may want to make up a lyrics about certain things, you know. And even even just to um, talk a few words yeah. in their language. Yeah. It's the greatest thing, you know. You don't, you, you don't 
you don't realize how much them appreciate of that, you know. Well, the classic thing is the artist turning up and not even knowing what country they're in and saying the wrong country. Yeah, it happens <laughs> all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. But I've seen you do like your like language, your lingua thing. Lingua thing yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, great, great. Yeah. And it's interesting you do this research and kind of find out where you're going and what's going on there because yeah, each country's got its own exactly. politics and reality going on definitely definitely yeah man I find that even when I went to Africa first you know like when I went to Sierra Leone when you when you're looking on the 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 internet they say like I, there used to be a bad war you know civil war there so they say it's a very dangerous place and one of the poorest places on earth and you shouldn't really go there and everything like that. But when we went there, it was very peaceful. You know, people coming together after the war and everything. I'd never seen so much Mercedes Benz in my life. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because they saw the diamonds in there and everything. You know what I mean? So it's, a, it's and the city parties, you know, it's better than a lot of parts in the UK. Well, the media likes to put across this idea, okay, Africa's like this, the Caribbean's like that. Yeah, you go right. to Jamaica, you're going to get shot. Yeah. You go to Mexico, you're going to get your head cut off. You go to Africa, and then people are going to be just in famine. Yeah. And it's like, the, the world's much more complicated than yeah, that. Yeah, much more complicated. And, you know, it's an agenda that they might have, you know, trying to take people's mind off certain places, you know. Because certain places like Africa is on the rise, you know, if you see certain places, you know. In places which I haven't even been, but you see them on the internet, like Rwanda. You know, they say it's one of the cleanest cities in the whole world, or crunches in the whole world, you know what I mean? So all those things are changing, you know. So that's why it's good to travel, you know, and you can see things for yourself, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I guess it's it, as a lyricist like you as well, being able to tell people about it and educate people, that's a great gift and a responsibility as well but really a great kind of thing to be able to tell people about stuff yeah man yeah man I find that you can uplift people you know even if they haven't got the chance to, to travel you can edify them you know educate them about certain things that's why I keep saying like to a lot of the younger DJs um, especially like in Jamaica and thing like a lot of them talk about gun things you know and keep it street you know, they got, they got to talk to the street to be relevant, you know, and to have a hit tune, you got to talk like you're in the street. But they can uplift the street, you know, because they actually do travel and they actually see certain other things which could uplift people in their communities instead of just talking like you've never been anywhere, you know, and this is all you know. Because some of them, that is all them know. But you as a person who has traveled and has seen different things and has seen different ideas and seen different things work in the world, you are the one who should be able to benefit your people. Yes, it's, 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 a, it's a responsibility and something which is, um, it's, it's like a really powerful force. Just the simplicity of some words mm -hmm. is such a powerful thing. But words, they manifest, you know, words. It's like words are thoughts and thoughts are vibrations, you know, and even we as people, the walking vibration, you know, if you take it under a microscope, you're just vibrating, you know, so we're all vibration, you know. So it's a spiritual thing, you know. So words can actually manifest and become something, you know. One of the things it says in the Bible, which I agree with, is and in the beginning was the word and it manifests and took on flesh. So words can actually manifest, you know. It's not just... Yeah, they're power, powerful things. Yeah, man, powerful yeah, man. Things. Words, sound and power. Yeah, it, It's sure. a great thing. That's why you must be careful of the words that you use and be careful of the words that you choose. Yeah, and you see... You see people controlling people with bad words and bad, and false, you know, this whole thing about fake news now and yeah, stuff yeah, and yeah, yeah. no one knows what to believe and they're words which are making people believe things which aren't true. And exactly, exactly. That's why I, I try to tell people if you look within yourself a lot of times, you know, some of the answers are kind of within you, you know, for that divine essence which is within yourself, you know, sometimes if you look within instead of just looking without, uh, just reading it in a book and taking that as, as gospel, you know. Well, whilst we're sort of talking about sort of lifestyle and kind of liberty things, it's kind of, um, I just wanted to ask you a bit about like your, your veganism as well, because um, um, veganism is such a big thing now, but yeah. you, it's something you've been involved in for a very long time and something that is like, that, that's deep within the kind of Rasta philosophy as well. And I just wonder if you want to talk about that a bit. Yeah, man. Um, can I stop eating meat? from I was about 16. 
That's a long, long, long time ago. I think know? it's the same for me around that time. Yeah, yeah. I was just eating something. I said, you know what? This is an animal, you know. And I wasn't comfortable with it anymore, you know. And at that time, I was more adapting the Rastafari way of life, you know. And at the time, Rasta is talking about ital, you know, and the life energy within foods, you know. And you will see enough people uh, are vegetarian. They were vegan even before the, the, the word vegan was popular, you know. Enough rats, you know. Enough rats eat fish the same way, but, you know, a lot of rats was talking about ital food and ital liberty. And it had a great impression on me, you know. And I stopped eating the meat, carried on with, with fish and dairy for a bit, but then looked at the fish and said, no, can't really eat the fish no more. And I was never really comfortable with the fish anyway, to be honest, you know. I could never eat the head. You know, it's like it's the it, face. I yeah, guess. like him, I look at me, you know, so I said, no, no, no. And even when I am, um, I used to go to the food shops and um, order fish. I said, can you take off the head? They said, oh, you're born in England, Russ. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you say, buy, yeah. you know, if you eat what, beef or chicken, you don't generally see the head. No, you quite, <laughs> it's like, but a fish, it's like, bang, it's there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like North Jamaican, they can eat the head, you know. I suck out the eyes and eat the teeth and everything, you know. But I could never do it. So maybe I was born to be vegan, you know. So that's one of the things. So I stopped the fish. And then I carried on with the dairy products for a while. But at the time, I was getting some bad stomach pains, you know. I was getting gastritis all the time, you know. And I didn't know what it was. And the doctor, they just... So it's just gastritis, here's some gaviscon or whatever, you know, you'll be all right. We finally kept returning, you know, so started to read up certain things and I, I read up about lactose intolerance, you know. Yeah, man, big, big thing, you know. So I cut the dairy out of the equation and lo and behold, I never had a gastritis ever again, you know. It was the, it was the, the, the milk, you know, the dairy products, you know. Can't digest the, the, the milk sugar, you know. And I'm a strong believer in any way that you shouldn't be drinking milk anywhere because it's for yeah, a calf. Yeah, the baby food of another species. Yeah, it's crazy. It's quite a crazy thing to be consuming. It's, it's madness. And if you will see somebody in a, in, a, in a field drinking out of a cow's udder, you'd say it's him crazy. You might have called police and say, that's a madman. But that's what people are doing, you know what I mean? They're drinking the, 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 the milk of another and, and drinking it after the weaning period as well. Cara calf knows after a certain time, you don't need to drink that milk anymore. You know what I mean? So, humans are doing that and they give you the calcium thing and then you get to realize that you can get calcium from plants and other things, you know? So, we cut out dairy as well, you know? So, we become fully blown vegan or strict vegetarian, whichever you want to call it, and starting to travel like that, you know? It's like, it get difficult. Can I go into yeah, some places? Yeah, certain places it's like, I mean, I I still uh, eat some uh, dairy stuff, I still eat some cheese and things, but I'm a, I've been a vegetarian for like 30 years or something and it's like... Yeah, yeah. And yeah, if, if you're not eating any dairy or anything, then it's like certain countries, very difficult. Yeah, yeah. And they've never even, they've never um, overstand it. Like, yeah, like what, What's wrong with you? Yeah, exactly. I went to Serbia. Serbia and... I said, no, I don't want none of this in a, in a restaurant. And they were saying, oh, is he ill? You know, what sickness does he have? Yeah, when, when's he going to get better? I hope <laughs> yeah. he's better soon. Yeah, yeah, so you've had that as well. Yeah, you know, course, you know what I mean? So all them things. So enough time to bring my, my own food anyway, you know. Like me start off with a hub. And then the start, then hub I get too much, me bring um, steamer. Yeah, I, I remember when we were in... Um... We were in Portugal and you brought your steamer. We, in the end, we actually found some good food there, but it was yeah, still yeah. kind of... And I'm the same, I have my emergency supplies because I never know if I'm going to turn up and there's like... Yeah. It's happened several times. But it's no, like, there's okay. only meat. But no idea is my work with my blender. Okay. So, yeah, so it's a smoothie every morning, so I'm all right, you know. And how... So you, you seem... Because um, I talk about the, 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 the way that it's become really popular in a minute and, and, and also about like, like your, your, your videos have become popular but just but, but, but sort of backing up a bit it's like how did you manage to educate yourself so much about food and veganism and it's like that you seem, you seem to know a lot about it yeah it's just um, it's just life because you're living it that's the thing you know and a lot of things you see me talking about are things that I actually do if you see me I say like 
that's why it can seem like surprising because oh, I never thought of that. You know, even thing like slicing up cucumber and making cucumber water, it's thing that we do anyway. So when it comes to tell lyrics, people go, oh, I never thought of that. Wow. <laughs> yes, I mean, I said, but I just something my window. And then um, even like when I went to South Africa and my son was, he, he wasn't too well. Guy he got like flu-like symptoms and they took us to this um, herbal um, doctor. It's a ras, you know. And he introduced us to buku. So he gave him some buku and garlic, you know. It's a, it's a herb called buku. And it, within a day, it cured him completely. So when I do a post about buku, I just explain it in that way, like where I went and and just spice it up a little bit, you know. So it's like personal life experiences also. And reading books, you know. Read like books about health. We've been reading it for a long time, you know. Like, um, you know. People like Leila, Africa, Nutricide, and all these kind of books, you know, and Queen Afu, and a lot of people, you know, we read their books, you know. So I mean, just educate myself, you know. A lot, a lot of people they 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 pay no attention to what they eat, and it's kind of it's for me that seems crazy because it's like you you literally are what you eat. I mean, it's exactly exactly don't get more important. No, exactly, you are what you eat. You know, even when you start learning about protein and amino acids and how they break down and Whatever you eat, it's got to become part of you. You know, you just got to break that back down into you. So you you really are what you eat, you know what I mean? And as I say, some people know more about them care than they know about them their, their body, you know? And if like there's bad bad oil or anything, they're not putting out them care. If they mean about bad petrol, they're not putting out them care. I said, no, man, you know, it's a bad petrol. I said, over there. So, but food, you know what I mean? For some reasons, you know, they, they just neglect their body and when they get sick and their body starts rejecting something, so things, they, they start to wonder why and what's happening. And 99% of the illnesses are directly um, because of the food that people eat, you know, it's like a yeah, nutrient sure. side, you know. So then that's the way to cure it, you know. And but Also just the basics of like, because we're so used to, you know, having food generally, it's like there's a saying, I think, is, is it we're three meals away from war or something. It's like if you, everybody, food disappeared completely and nobody had, but they had to skip three meals, then war would just kick off because that basicness of like hunger and things, it's kind of, we're sort of, we're taken, we're taken away from that basicness by sort of having an abundance of food around us. But like, yeah. it's such a primal, important thing. It is, I know what you're saying still, but sometimes the hunger is not even hunger. You know, sometimes you're thirsty, sometimes you're, it's just your mind being tricked by certain things, even like sugar. You know, sugar can... It's powerful stuff. Yeah, it can just trick your mind and say, you're not full, you know. Eat some more, you know what I mean? But really, you are full. The rest of your body is saying no, but, you know, it's tricky. It reaches the same part of your brain like um, like cocaine, they say, like dopamine, you know. It's all those kind of things. So you have to be really, really careful. And it, what it is, it's a business. It's that people profiting out of it, you know, out of disease. That's the big thing, you know. So when you see people um, selling all these things and promoting all these things and they know they're not good, you know, they're doing it all for the sake of money and it, it's not a good thing, you know. And talking about your, like, the veganism and, and kind of, like, the activity around it is, like, one thing that's really happened is is your weekly, um, like, food kind of news bulletins or whatever and, and especially the, the the cucumber, yeah, really went viral. I mean, what 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 happened there? What what was that like? Yeah, well, if we go back to the 2008, mm. I did a song called "Wami Eat." Yes, yeah, and that the was, video in the shop, video in the yeah, shop, yeah yeah yeah, 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 and it was very popular, you know, amongst vegans and everybody, you know, not just vegans, but everybody seemed to like it still, and they make a lot of memes out of it as well, you know, and it's going around and big vegan organizations that share it and everything. And even the um, Vegan Society of England, they asked me to be one of their ambassadors. So I became one of their ambassadors as well. So I was promoting the vegan thing, you know, a lot, you know. And um, say a couple of years ago, um, my children, they're big people, but still children. They says, Dad, social media thing, I get big now, you know, I would try to step into it a little bit, you know. Uh, I was old school, you know. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, yeah. so, I said, all right, I could try a thing. So we start the, the Facebook and the Instagram thing and do some posts and then start thinking about the angle and we say, oh, 
vegan thing, you know. I wish he said it. I watched this program called Clean Eating, you know, because the reality is I was doing some of the vegan posts and I said, well, I don't just want to do the vegan posts, I mean, I'm going to do something else, you know what I mean, because it's a whole heap of things. It's before the medical Mondays and things. Mm -hmm. And um, I watched this film called, this program called Clean Eating and he was showing how big the vegan thing is getting. Yeah, because it seems to be such a such a big thing. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know realize it was so so big. So I said, all right then. Um, like oh, me, me a vegan and thing. Let me impart some of my knowledge upon the thing. So we said we could do medical Monday, where we try to tell people the benefits of certain fruits and vegetables, and see how we go. And also let's do a what me eat Wednesday as well, where we ask people to try a vegan meal for the first time and. How was it? And post your review of it, and you know certain recipes and all those kind of things. So I did the medical Monday, and the first one I did, I think it was about ginger uh, and lemon, and I just talked. Powerful it. stuff there. Yeah, powerful stuff. And I just talked it, like when I talked to you, and then it, it got some, a lot of views and things. I say we we might be onto something new, you know. So we did that, and we did the one meat Wednesdays. And then I said to myself, let me, let me don't talk it like normal talking. Let's do it in my own style. Let me try to rhyme it with melody and, you know, put a little humor in it and whatever. So we did one, I think it was avocado, and I did it with rhyme. And it got like two million views. I said, what? Two million? Yeah, that's on the Facebook, you know. And I said, wow, people like it, you know. Like people are going crazy about it, so... They say, yeah, man, this is the way forward. So then I did the one about the cucumber, and that one just exploded, you know? It's like, that one like got hundreds of millions of views, you know? I think um, some people, it got millions on mine. It got like about 20 million on just on my side. But some and then people, when it starts to get shared. Yeah. There were some people, Unilad, you know? They're one of the Facebook sites, you know? We share a lot of videos. So they asked if they could share it. No, they did not. Them share it. And um, it went viral, you know, because they have like millions of them um, subscribers. Yeah, yeah that's it. The whole viral thing must be quite a trip. It went viral, yeah. And you see people like Leo, Naomi, Cam Naomi Campbell started to share it. And you see people like Beyonce's mom start to say, Why? Watch this. And there you say, We had something I go on. I saw, you know. So I got hundreds of millions of views. And everywhere we go in the world, you know, and people say, oh, they love the cucumber thing and, and we just carried it on. We've done it for like, um, about a couple of years. We're still doing it, you know, because there's so many fruits and veg and we're still doing it and still getting a good response, you know, even though Facebook is not as big as it used to be, you know. But the in Instagram has gone crazy. Uh, Instagram, I do it now, as yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah it's Instagram doing it now. So we have enough money, like over 300,000 on Instagram, Instagram, you know, so that's, that's what's doing it now and it's going good and, it's making people see the other things that I do as well, you know, like the new people who come in and say, all right, it's good, you know. Like you'd, at first, you would have some people come in and say, this man should make a record. <laughs> Maybe he made some before, actually. Yeah, and then some people would say, he's been making them for years, check him out. And then they say, oh, yeah, it's great. And I love the lyrics and, you know, so it's a, it's a, it's a good thing still, so... We just give thanks, you know, and as you say, it's blowing up now all over the world, you know, it's people into the into the vegan thing. There's been a new film, um, The Game Changers. I don't know if you've seen that film, but and the producers are people like uh, Louis Hamilton and Arnold Schwarzenegger and Djokovic, you know what I mean? So all big these names involved. Big names, yeah, yeah, yeah. And enough people are getting into it, you know, so. What's it like being part, because you, you see these viral things happen and they, they, they come up and, Everyone and they're spread everywhere. And for me, you know, I've known you a long time and, you know, lifelong fan of your music. It's great to see this thing suddenly like it's on the news and it's like, this is amazing. But also, when things go really public like that, it can get a bit crazy as well. I don't know if there's been any sort of, because there's some strange people out there as well. Yeah, and like there's some negativity in the world. And, I know, I know. But I haven't really booked up on them. I think sometimes um, I just keep my vibe. Car. The greatest thing about like going viral, if you go viral with something that you already do or you already are, you know, if it's something way out, completely different to you, then it's harder. 
but I am who I am, you know. So and I'm approachable, you know. Like I'm kind of humble that way, you know. I don't see me as better than nobody, you know. Everybody have something to offer in this life, you know. So people can approach me, and I think when they see that kind of vibe, it kind of brings that kind of vibe out in them as well, you know. Because even you got people who. Even with the vegan thing, you know, you have some people that hate vegans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People are very passionate about it because yeah. it it really challenges their perception of everything. It's exactly. Like a, it's like how can you have a different outlook? That, yeah, that's confused me. And so it's I'm like angry. It's like you're saying at them. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm how could you, you? Yeah, how could you still eat that little lamb or whatever? You know. But I chat to people who who are not vegans about vegan thing and even in dances and. They go, they love it, you know what I mean? It's, it's just the way I put it, you know? And even some of those um, sites, they would put um, headlines like, this is the only vegan I would listen to, you know? Because I'm not really judging them, you know? Because I have... Yeah, you're, just, you're just sharing your knowledge. Yeah, yeah. I'm just sharing my and, knowledge. And, and also entertaining. It's that, again, I've said it a few times, you know, I don't know who came up with the word, but like edutainment, yeah, yeah, yeah. education, but it's entertainment. Entertainment. Just things together. Yeah man, yeah man. Direct powerful combination. Yeah. And I'm not coming I'm not coming like with a hatred because most of my family, not my children, my children are vegans and everything, and my wife. But most of my like cousins and everything, they're not vegans. And I don't hate none of them. I love all of them, you know. So sometimes you just try and advise them yeah. on certain things and that's it. But you still love them the same way. So I'm coming from that position with people, you know. I'm not saying, oh, you're a wicked person. You're not starting a war. No, you're, you're a wicked person because you do this and do that. Cause there's some other people who are vegans who do things I don't like. You see what I say? So it, it, it just, it's just one of those things, you know. So we just I come from a position of, of love. Again, a bit, a bit of a surprise, I guess, that, that something that's important to you has become more important in like the mainstream, if you like, and in sort of wider society and... Something that was a bit of a, almost like a cult. You're a vegan. Are you in some weird gang or something? I know, I know. God. The more so-called famous people become vegans, the more it's, it's becoming acceptable, you know. And yeah, you've been involved in sort of music and activity for a long time. So I wonder what, what, what's going to be sort of happening in the future. What's, what's ahead for you? Well, I'm a sort of person. Uh, I just let Jab be my guide, you know. And um I've been guided so far very well and I give thanks, you know, and certain things happen to me like it's vibes, you know, like it's cause synchronicity, you know, it's like it's vibes. Like we don't believe in coincidence, you know, everything is for a reason. We're born coincidence and luck, you know, it's everything is for a reason, you know, so certain things have been guiding me in the right direction and I just continue to let it guide me, you know, and give thanks to the most I Rastafari and I give thanks to the ancestors and all these kind of things, you know. So they just give me the good vibe and lead me in a positive direction. So anything which is to come, I know it's going to be positive, you know. I don't know what direction, you know. Uh, I would have never said the, the viral thing would happen. Of course, yeah, that's so, totally unpredictable. Yeah, it? yeah, yeah. So I could never say that, but it did happen, you know, and I give thanks that it happened, you know. So what's the next chapter, you know? I have to give thanks, just keep doing what I'm doing. I keep doing it in a positive way, you know, and in a humble way. Nice. And the, the other thing that I'm asking all of the guests on the on the podcast is, um, it's a bit of a daft question, really, and it's nothing kind of too major, but like the book of dub, I'm opening the book of dub, I'm writing everyone's name, and just I wonder what people would want written next to their name, just something they've contributed or something they want to say about themselves and everyone I've spoken to has said something really different and it's kind of interesting I wonder what you'd want so I'm, I'm, I'm opening the book and I'm writing the name I just wonder what you'd want written next to it hard one you know <laughs> yeah I'm sure but maybe something just like conscious lyrics yeah, yeah. perfect yeah. perfect that's it because it's like those lyrics are, like I say I'm, I'm, I'm I guess because I'm not a vocalist and not a lyricist. I'm always you're always amazed by things other people can do that you can't. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm always amazed by singing and lyrics, and they bring my music to life. Exactly. And like the stuff you've recorded on my tracks in the past, I'm still playing them. And it's kind of you know some lyrics you wrote ages ago, you recorded them ages ago, but they're still being played. And the effect it has on people is very powerful. It's great to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a school, as we said before. You know, lyrics are a powerful thing. You know. And Lyrics can change the world, you know. As I say, the, the pen is mightier than the sword and a real thing, you know. 
That's why we have to choose our, weird, our words carefully, you know, and talk the right things, you know. Even to the young people, you know. Don't underestimate the power of your words, you know, because they might seem like they're not listening. You know, so, oh, no, dad, I don't want to hear that. Wait, 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 wait. Years and, later. Yeah, because when they go to their room and in their, they're in by themselves, and they're in silence, uh, your words are still ringing in their ears, you know. God, you can't block up your ears, you know. So you're hearing it even if you're going like you're not nah, hearing it. And as you said, later on, years down the line, you say, well, that's what dad said, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Powerful stuff. Well, Maccabee, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me uh, for the podcast. And uh, it's been very, very interesting. Yes, dear, it's been good. Yeah, you're a good interviewer. Yes, I am. Okay, Thanks again for joining me and Maccabee for this third episode of the Life in Dub podcast. Please subscribe to the show, visit the website, lifeindub.com, and feel free to email me at vibronics at gmail.com with any comments and suggestions for the show. I'll see you all again in two weeks for the next Life in Dub podcast.